Hi, I'm Carrie Hyde, and I'm the host of this podcast, and I am your pet's life coach. Today, we're going to be talking about feline kidney disease. So if you have a cat, I highly recommend you listen to this, this topic because the number one reason that cats go to veterinarians these days is for kidney failure. Um, bladder issues, those kind of things. It's, it's very important that we discuss it today. So I'm very excited to introduce to you a couple of people, but first I'm going to introduce our guest co-host, Jamie Cliffin. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. I think I just pronounced your last name wrong. It's all good. <laughs> we talked about her dad's name is Clifford, her last name is Clifton, Clifton and Clifford gets in my mind because um, of dogs. But anyway, so uh, Jamie is a cat behaviorist, which is why she's here today. So Jamie, tell us a little bit about what a cat behaviorist does. Well, what I do is I help people to communicate with their cats and vice versa. So I do that through clicker training, which is positive reinforcement based training. And I also help people to resolve a whole spectrum of issues that go on with cats. So whether that's not using the litter box or cat on cat aggression, just all of those come down to not understanding the basic needs of the cat. So that's what I help do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I brought Jamie on because I know she sees a lot of cats. And so we're really trying to get the message out so we can help our cats live happier, healthier lives. So together, Jamie and I are going to be interviewing our next guest, which I am always so excited to introduce to you because she's an amazing, amazing veterinarian, Dr. Jean Dodds. Thank you for being here today. You're welcome. My pleasure. So Dr. Dodds, if you don't know, is world renowned. Um, she's fabulous, but her practice is in Garden Grove, so she's very close to me in the spa, which is great for me because I can refer my clients to her, and, and back and forth we can kind of work together that way. So I'm just so excited, Dr. Dodds, that you're here and that we're going to be talking about this issue. So tell us a little bit about um, before, I know we talk a lot about you on the, the program a little bit and how you've gotten into veterinary medicine. Um, but what do you think, um, you heard me just say that that's the number one reason that cats go to the vet. Do you agree with that? Well, it's partly that. It's also behavioral issues, definitely, with cats not using the litter box anymore when they're stressed, and I'm sure Jamie knows all about that. We also have cats have diabetes very commonly, and they also have hyperthyroidism when they get to be older. But kidney disease and chronic kidney disease is a very big problem in the cat, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so what do you think is, is causing it? Is, I'm sure there's lots of causes, but can you go over those causes with us? Well, the problem is that it's more common in male cats to have a blocked uh, urethra. So they don't urinate properly because they have crystals and eventually can get stones. And so therefore, because of the way the anatomy of the cat is shaped and, and other species, they don't urinate properly. And so that causes a secondary problem with bacterial infection, especially if the prepuce isn't clean in the male. Now in the female, we're luckier because they have a short urethra and they don't have the problem that the male has, but we still have problems with diet a lot of dietary problems uh, promote stone formation and crystal formation in cats and other species. And if the urine pH becomes alkaline instead of more acidic, like it should be in pets, then you're going to promote bacterial growth. Mm -hmm. So we want our cats to have an acidic urine, mm -hmm. right? Uh, acidic urine, lots of liquids, and the foods that are um, promote well-being and not the glutens and the grains and all the other things we have in commercial pet foods right. that often have too much carbohydrate and sugar in them because they're more palatable that way. And the cat, unlike the dog, is an obligate carnivore. They must have meat in their diet. The dog can have both meat and carbohydrates and grains and cereals because they've adapted to that from the original wolf. The cat has not. So even though people think that the cat can eat lots of grains and carbohydrates and they're tastier and yummier just like <laughs> us they get fat and they get lazy and they can have many diseases especially diabetes and kidney disease wow so aside from diet is there anything else you think might be you know can cats be born with this is this genetic is there a genetic component to it is there um, other components other than diet 
there, there certainly are, and there are certain families of cats and types of cats that are more susceptible um, to any kind of disorder. It depends on the breed history and the, the cat, you know, pedigreed cats and exotic cats have become very popular. Um, but even though um, cats are smaller and they tend to live longer than many dogs do, actual, the cost of caring for a cat as, uh, for veterinarians is higher than it is for dogs, even though there are more cats as pets in our country and most countries than there are dogs. It can cost four to five times more per year to care for a cat. If it's hypothyroid, if it's got kidney disease, if it's a diabetic, because you have to keep checking on them and monitoring them and adjust things as needed. Whereas in the dog, um, there's gonna be less problems with that because they develop things more slowly with the kinds of diseases they're more prone to. Do you think that um, spaying and neutering has an effect on kidney disease at all? Like, er, like too early or too late? Is there a better time to spay or neuter, or is there a link to that at all? Well, you know, you're asking me all kinds of very um, important, complicated questions, and the answer is convoluted. <laughs> because yes, there definitely is a trend to want to spay and neuter dogs and cats later than we used to. And in pounds and shelters where they've got a problem with euthanasia, if these animals are not adopted, they have to neuter and spay kittens and puppies much earlier than they would ideally, because otherwise they're gonna go out and reproduce. So we've got this societal dilemma. What's best for the cat and the dog and what's best for us in society? Oh, yeah. And they don't mesh. So for example, we like to neuter cats and dogs when they're at puberty, okay? The problem with the female cat, however, even though we wanna um, spay a female dog later, like after two heat cycles, can't do that in the cat because they keep cycling. <laughs> so everybody tries to keep the cat from cycling, you know, with using a Q-tip and, and trying to fool the cat into thinking they're being uh, serviced, so to speak, uh, but it doesn't always work. Wait, and did, then we have the problem did, wait, wait, with whoa, the whoa, feral and wait, 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 wait. running around. <laughs> did you sorry. say something about a Q-tip? Yes. Well, can you? I People lost. use Q-tips and other things to stick up the vagina of the female cat in heat to try to get her out of heat because she's thinking that she's been serviced by a male. <laughs> Cat breeders, I guess. Don't even go there. It's hard. I did not okay. know that was a thing. I'm no. sorry. Oh, but, but no. But rem remember, uh, <laughs> remember that male cats running free are a serious problem because not only do they run around and try to service uh, female cats in heat, but they also can bite because male cats will bite and they can transmit feline immunodeficiency virus and feline leukemia virus in younger cats. And so it's quite dangerous. And so here we are, we love cats, we love male and female cats, and we're trying to do the right thing. But some male cats don't want to be confined. Right. I'm going to go outside whether you like it or not. Yeah, yeah. So behaviorally, obviously, uh, we've got to deal with that, right? Jamie? Yeah. <laughs> no comment on any of that. Um, Dr. Dodds, um, do you feel that there is, um, or, or do you feel that there are um, in-home environmental concerns that are contrib contributing factors to kidney feline kidney disease, um, like quality of air or off-gassing of, you know, um, furniture, anything like that we should be concerned about? Actually, I couldn't hear specifically what your what your suggestions were. Oh, she's asking what if there's things any in the environment. Any, any environmental stuff within the home that could cause it, like uh, um, like off-gassing of furniture? Because um, my understanding is there's a link between kidney disease and hyperthyroidism, and I read a study a few years ago, so I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on on environmental. And well, there, there's way too many things associated with the environment and older cats. I mean, first thing, it was not enough iodine in the diet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the commercial pet food started, then there was too much iodine in the diet, and so the commercial pet food prescription companies made diets that were low in iodine to help control early stage hyperthyroidism. Well, then the diets didn't have enough iodine and they be, became sick because they were depleted in iodine. So right now, just like the taurine issue, 
and the mm -hmm. carnitine issue in terms of mm -hmm. uh, taurine for cats, which is essential for heart function. Mm -hmm, right. um, we now have diets that have the right level of taurine in them for dogs and cats and the right level of iodine. So, I mean, we're totally at the mercy of the commercial pet food industry that's selling pet foods. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars are paid are spent in North America taking care of cats and dogs, not just food, but toys and all the other kinds of things we do. And then we have flame retardants. You have the same thing with right. flame retardants on, on uh, furniture and in the home. And the same things that affect infants crawling around the home can affect pets that are walking around and, and doing that. And pets are sniffing bushes and they're outside uh, rolling in the grass and stuff that's had fertilizers and pesticides and whatever. Then we have all the new flea and tick preventers that are guaranteed to kill a flea or a tick and also the pet. So, you know, I mean... I love how you don't mince words there. We've created this ourselves. <laughs> guaranteed to kill a flea and your pet. I love that you just say it like that. Um, so what about essential oils? Those kind of things burning oh. in the homes. You think those... Can... And I'm a big essential oil user. You are? Mm-hmm. Yep, but I am well, very careful. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think those can have an effect on the kidneys as yeah, well? There are many essential oils that are not tolerated with cats, certainly. And also you put them on dogs and then the cat licks the dog. So, uh, right. you know, that's not unusual. So there are essential oils that we would not use. And there are flea preventives that have essential oils in them. Uh, some of them are safe for dogs. Many of them are not safe for cats. And so we've got the same problem again. Got to be careful. Now, that's an interesting one because Dr. Melissa Shelton, I follow her, and she's a holistic practitioner who um, has done some research um, with looking into studies with essential oils with cats. And not to not to get off onto a different train, but um, she's got different thoughts on that. So it's really interesting to see how um, yeah to see how it how yeah. it differs. There's I think a lot of it's yeah. important for us to know every animal is going to react differently. Yeah, that's so true. If if your friend's cat says she's been burning essential oils for 25 yes. years and that cat's been fine, we still have to eliminate those things if we see responses in our own personal cats, right? We have to be careful. What are some of the symptoms of kidney failure? So if if I yeah. if my cat's got some symptoms, what would what would I be looking for if I thought my cat might have kidney failure? Okay, well, I think what we should do now is uh, go through the slides we have so we can okay. make a summary of what Perfect. we know about chronic kidney disease in the cat. Perfect. And just so you know, this information was um, adapted from the Cor Cornell Feline Health Center in 2019. Okay, so, and this so is... the, that information is readily available online for anybody that wants to read about it. And okay. I've taken some of the salient features from my colleagues there to make this PowerPoint. So awesome. I think if we can have the next slide. Okay. Yes, this is the anatomy of a cat. And interestingly, this cat is a white cat. And that's just another point. Animals and people that have light color, they're more pale in color. They may have a light pink nose and uh, pink eye rims and whatever, are more susceptible to environmental changes and challenges and pollution than our animals with darker colors or even ourselves with darker skin. Oh, interesting. So that's really important. And you can see that it shows you in this anatomy slide that the kidneys are very high up in the abdomen, right uh, underneath the top of the uh, spine. Right. So what happens is that things that can affect that part of the body, even trauma, right? can sure. uh, also sometimes bruise the kidneys. Hmm. And then you see that both of the kidneys um, are, uh, there's your ur ureters that come out of the kidneys and they come out and they turn. So you can get crystals blocking those. And then they go to the urethra, okay? And right. uh, so the ureters go into the bladder and the bladder goes into the urethra. So the bladder can store all kinds of things like uh, low grade stones and crystals and they can block the whole transit then from the ure urethra. So as animals age, the kidneys become less active. They progressively lose some of their function. For example, chronic interstitial nephritis, some early changes of kidneys as they age, is not unusual at all in a dog or a cat as they get older, and we expect that. Okay. But that means that there isn't as much kidney reserve present if something goes wrong. So we have to be considered about that. And of all the kidney uh, urinary tract diseases in dogs and cats, chronic kidney disease is the most common. Now, 
what are the purposes of the kidneys? Clearly to um, flush out, remove impurities from the blood. And that can be all kinds of things. It can be proteins that get through because the, as the kidney gets damaged, it releases proteins through the glomerulus that it would not normally allow to get through the system. So you can have protein urea, more protein, more protein in, in the uh, urine. And that's an indication that the kidneys aren't filtering properly. But it also has to filter toxins, some of the things we talked about. Okay? Right. So the ureters carry the urine to the bladder, as we showed you in the anatomical slide. And then it comes out through your, the urethra. Okay, so what does the cat do? The cat doesn't feel well. It feels crummy, actually. It, it may not want to eat. It feels... Um, Unkempt. The the hair on the cat is sticky uppy, we say. <laughs> it doesn't lie nice and smooth and flat and mm -hmm. shiny. And they lose weight because they're not eating normally, they're not digesting normally, they're not urinating normally. Okay? Now they can't concentrate the urine typically. So when they can't concentrate the urine, they're they're actually gonna start to drink more to try to flush the toxins out. They have a, a, a insatiable um, need to drink more fluids, and that would, of course, ideally flush the stuff out of the out of the kidneys and into into the environment. Okay, wow. but when they drink more, they urinate more. So some pet guardians get really upset because the cat's urinating everywhere, outside the box, all over the house, whatever, wow. because it's drinking so much. So again, we've got a sign, however, and we call it polydipsia meaning too much drinking, and polyuria, too much urine. And that's one of the first things that the pet guardian will notice and go to their veterinarian with their cat who's obviously ADR, ain't doing right, okay? <laughs> They're using losing body nutrients, okay? So once they use body nutrients, their metabolism is abnormal in their body, and they're going to lose appetite anorexia they're gonna wow. they're not gonna want to eat because their metabolic balance is off they have um, oxidative stress going on in their cells which can lead to obesity it can lead to infections and it can lead to uh, inflammation periodontal disease really bad teeth tartar in the teeth wow. buildup and even cancer oh, so wow. we have to worry about that in any pet okay as well as ourselves blood pressure can go up so when the cat comes into the clinic and is it's ADR it can have high blood pressure and that can affect the eyes, the brain, and the heart. So again, you have multiple effects of this chronic kidney disease. And then what also happens as the kidneys start to fail is the pet becomes anemic. It has a low-grade anemia, and the blood counts are lower. So you can tell that by looking at the gums. The gums look pale. The eye membranes look pale. The foot pads may not be as pink as they used to be. So those are things that the pet owner should watch for and go to your veterinarian for a checkup. Okay, so how do we diagnose it? The veterinarian, first thing they'll do is they will recommend some tests. They can be blood tests, they can be urinalyses, whatever. And they're gonna to have to determine by those tests whether treatment is needed now and what kind of treatment it would be. So please, when you go to your veterinarian and you get a sticker shock because they're gonna to have to do some tests, please do it. So blood tests, the first thing you would do is a blood urea nitrogen. And what that does in the blood is it determines how much protein nitrogen is there. And if the kidneys aren't working properly, it's going to be high. If the cat's on a raw diet, it would be normally higher than the reference range. So please remember that cats fed raw diets don't have the same parameters that come from the reference lab or the in-clinic machine. Those are based on kibbles. Okay. okay, so well, there are differences there, and that's one of the things that I've studied extensively, and so we can help people with that. And when we get blood testing done through a hemopat, we actually note if the animal's on a raw diet, uh, what the normal range should be. So please remember, when you go to your veterinarian, tell them all those things, even if you think your veterinarian will be aghast because you're feeding a raw <laughs> diet. Don't be shameful. Tell them, because that's going to affect the interpretation of the results, okay? Okay. So now the blood urea and nitrogen can also be elevated if the animal has just eaten and it's still absorbing the nutrients from the food in the blood and it hasn't completely filtered it yet. So all of those things can be important. When did the animal have its last meal in relation to having the blood drawn? Okay. Creatinine is the protein that's very important in the urine because if it's elevated in the blood and the urine, then that's telling you the kidneys aren't functioning properly. 
and electrolytes. We're going to measure the sodium level and the potassium level. Uh, when the kidneys aren't working, the sodium and potassium levels change. They go up. And that causes a change in the pH, causes many, many changes, and it can even cause collapse. You can actually have shock from imbalance in the sodium and potassium. You do the red cell count to see if they've got any anemia yet, and you measure the protein concentrations in the blood. In other words, if all the protein is coming out in the urine, the level in the blood may be depleted slowly, okay? So the veterinarian is going to recommend a urinalysis, okay? So what is the concentration of the urine? In other words, if the cat's uh, drinking more and urinating more, the urine's going to be dilute, and you expect that. So that's not necessarily abnormal. If the cat's not drinking more, normal drinking, the concentration of the urine will tell you if the kidneys are functioning or not. So the urine pH, pH can be off. As I said, it can be too acidic or too alkaline, usually more alkaline than it should be. But typically, the urine specific gravity is very important because people get very low specific gravity because they forgot to tell the veterinarian their cat's drinking two or three times more than it did before. So obviously it's gonna be reurinating more and the concentration's gonna be lower. How much protein is in the urine? A trace, one plus, no big deal. Older animals often have one plus. Even two plus may not be significant, but if it's more than that, it's abnormal, okay? Are there red blood cells in the urine? And, and when they took the urine sample, they should actually take it with a needle and syringe rather than let the free catch. Because remember, in a male, you get prepucial stuff that can be in the urine. And in a female, you can have a, a vulva things, anything around the urine or around the outside of the vulva could get in the urine. So they need to take it with a needle and syringe. That's called cystocentesis. However, if the needle happens to hit a blood vessel on the surface of the bladder, you can have a little blood in the urine. But it'll tell you that. There'll be an occult blood level, meaning you can't see it unless you look under a microscope, or there'll be actual red blood cells, and so that's important as well. Other cells, white blood cells, um, fungi, oh my goodness, yeast, things that shouldn't be there, right? Right, right. Or crystals from drugs or something else. And then you do a urine culture in that case for bacteria. So sometimes you can see bacteria in the urine at a low level, and when you culture it, nothing grows in 72 hours. That's good, that's what you want, but that's the culture. And then other tests that might be needed, depending on the, the it's getting more expensive as we go forward. You may need to do an ultrasound. What does the bladder and the kidneys look like by ultrasound? Okay, you might need to do x-rays because you can see a bladder stone or crystals uh, right. if they're really prominent on an x-ray. Um, ultrasounds are more expensive than x-rays, but you, again, your veterinarian has to decide. They're gonna look at microscopic samples. They may even wanna do a biopsy of a kidney under an ultrasound guided probe. Hmm. Now you're talking about big issues here now, okay? Blood pressure, you're gonna measure blood pressure. You can do the new test, SDMA which is symmetric dimethyl arginine. That's a new test offered by the IDEX laboratories. And it can be really, really high. Uh, by the way, pets on raw diets have slightly elevated levels and they have not determined what the normal level is, can be, but, but we have enough data to show it can be elevated. And they also haven't determined the upper limits of the normal range for kittens and puppies versus adults. So those are new tests that can be done. Next slide, please. So just really quick, because I, I don't want to not ask this question, because I get it a lot from my clients, where their pets are eating a, a raw diet, and then their vet tells them they can't have that much protein. What do you think about that? That's nonsense. <laughs> has to do the phosphorus levels, That's right? That's pretty, pretty, pretty blunt up. Because of course I have, they can I, have plenty of protein. You know, it's not even the protein content of the commercial foods or homemade food. It's how much protein they're actually eating. I mean, the bag could say it's 32% protein. And if it's a tiny chihuahua or a little kitten, mm. they're not eating very much of it, so they're not getting that much protein, okay? So again, it, it doesn't matter. It's the quality of the protein, the digestibility of the protein, and how easily it's assimilated that are important. Not the That's crap so protein, excuse me, <laughs> they can put in commercial foods that are inexpensive because of that. So do you recommend your clients stay on a raw diet if they have kidney failure? 
If they're doing very well, absolutely. But remember, not all individuals tolerate a raw diet. So there are right. going to be some uh, pets, dogs or cats, um, that don't do well on a raw diet, even within a household where all the other pets eat raw and thrive. Mm -hmm. Well, what so about? That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the raw diet. It's the individual pet's requirement yeah, sure. for sense. a diet that's slightly cooked or different or specially made for that particular animal. What about taking a cat off of kibble and putting them on a cooked, biologically appropriate diet? Would that be more beneficial than staying on a kibble, do you think? Absolutely. Why would you give kibble if you didn't have to? You know, whole <laughs> foods that have variety are much better, whether they're homemade um, or they're raw, you know, freeze-dried or dehydrated or high-pressure pasteurization raw. Yeah. Uh, remember, foods are not sterile, so raw diets will have bacteria and other organisms in them, so are kibble diets. Yeah, you so can take kibbles. kibble, um, soak it, and then culture it and it's full of things because they're not <laughs> sterile. Wow. Nothing we eat terrifying. is sterile either. What about clients who say they absolutely cannot come off the prescription diet because it's a prescription from their vet? Ooh, good what, question. What do you say to those clients? They, they want prescription diets or they don't. Well, veterinarians will tell them that because their cat has kidney failure, they absolutely have to be on a prescription diet mm -hmm. because it's a prescription. Yeah. Well, we can tell them that's not true. However, some animals that have bladder stones and have had surgery to remove them do need prescription diets and there are some good ones that will help prevent bladder stones and the reason why we use them in that specific situation only is because it's very difficult for the pet owner to make the appropriate diet to prevent stones from reoccurring okay okay just checking on that one because I, I, uh, I, I mean, have told people to do the Veterinarians use prescription diets because they were trained that way. Right. They yeah. were trained that way in veterinary school. They were trained that way in graduate school. They were trained that way when they uh, graduated because they got all of the um, goodies that were given to them by <laughs> big pet food industry. Mm -hmm. It's their job to sell their foods. Right. Do you feel... Um, why are we surprised about that? Um, the, the diets you were just talking about, Dr. Dodds, do you feel like it's most beneficial for them to be on them short term and then working with the veterinarian and then perhaps putting them on to transition that, transitioning to something else or do you think they should be on them long term sometimes? I think the first thing they need to do if they work well with their veterinarian is to talk to them about their concerns and ask them if they can try alternative diets from reputable you know, experienced animal nutritionists or board certified veterinary nutritionists, and many of them will recommend these diets because that's the only thing they know. Mm -hmm. Okay? But if the veterinarian is absolutely opposed to them doing anything else, then you have to say, I'm sorry, but I'm going to first seek a second opinion elsewhere. That's Do you good. see more cats with kidney we failure that are kibble fed versus raw fed? Yes. Oh. Well, that's not a fair question, uh, Carrie. <laughs> but the only reason it's not, no, no. The <laughs> reason it, I don't mean that you, that it's a good question, but it's not fair to answer it because there are so many more cats that are fed kibble diets than there are cats that are fed alternative diets. That's fair. So we don't have a matching number of animals. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the problem. Yeah. Now, but for animals that have had problems and we switch them to an alternative diet, most of them improve. In fact, I got an email um, just yesterday from a, a client who insisted that they do NutriScan on their cat and that they feed only the foods that NutriScan said were safe for their cat to eat. And their veterinarian um, in, let's see, this was August last year, we changed the diet. In February this year, the veterinarian did all the standard rechecks and said this is the first time in this cat's life that everything has been normal and the abnormal kidney values are almost normalized. This and he awesome. was so impressed that he's going to recommend this approach to his other clients. Awesome. That's this, so is how, this is how it That's goes. That's one case. That's awesome. That's really great. I try to get all of my cat people to not feed kibble because it's dehydrating. It's, Same here. You know, yeah. Like, please just mm -hmm. don't feed them kibble. Okay. Now, we'll go quickly now because we've talked a lot, a lot of these. What are the principles of treating canine kidney disease, okay? Chronic kidney disease, I should say, not canine. Maximize, minimize the buildup of toxic waste. That's by not allowing the cat to have them, right? Make sure so, there's lots of water around. Flea and Make tick sure that stuff. the electrolyte disturbance is balanced if the sodium, potassium, and phosphorus are out of it. Food, proper food, proper food. Control the blood pressure and slow down the progression of the disease. 
you might have to use hemodialysis. They may need to flush out the body with fluids, mm. right? Like you would in a person to reduce the toxic buildup of waste. Make sure that the animal can have subcutaneous fluids, intravenous only if it's critical, subcutaneous fluids about twice a week. And you can teach the client how to do that. So, so uh, we've had some veterinarians say, oh, no, 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 maintenance fluids to these cats is dangerous. That's not so. Maintenance fluids may be needed to flush the system. And um, clients, phosphate, pet sorry. owners can get that online themselves, correct? And learn how to do it? Yeah, they can teach people how to do it, absolutely. And you can get a bag the... bag of fluids and you, and, and you teach them how to give it sub-Q in more than one site, okay? But they like can purchase it on... have 100 mils... Sorry? They can purchase it online. I think Chewy.com has lactated ringers Yes. online. Absolutely. I think they're prescription. Yeah. Yeah. So you oh, can yeah. give How potassium supplements if you need them, and you can give phosphate binders to remove the excess phosphorus from the blood. Okay. Um, we control uh, blood pressure with medications, and we can use, if it's really, really bad and the cat is really anemic, we use the red cell hormone stimulant erythropoietin only if the red cell level goes really really low okay and then some cats actually have a kidney transplant i was gonna ask the that. Problem with that that's amazing is you have to find a donor who can give up a kidney okay yeah and the, the donor cat has to have the same blood type and tissue type as the recipient cat okay. because you can't transfuse the wrong blood type in what cats because you'll kill are? them okay no. No. how do you find so out what blood have... type your cat is the same way you do humans Beg your pardon? You just run a blood test to find out what your, how many different yes, blood types are there? Type, there. You, blood type, you blood type the recipient, and, you, and we had a case in Washington State where the cat with kidney failure was a rare blood type B. And they had to find a, a donor cat that was healthy that would donate its kidney, <laughs> well, <laughs> not really voluntarily, I was just um, that say was the same not. blood type. And you know what? She went to the pound in the shelter in her area, and they found this big gray cat, and God intervened, and it was a type B. Wow. And that cat, she, she had to adopt the, do the donor cat as well. That was the agreement. Yeah, So the donor That's cat fair. gave his kidney <laughs> to the sick cat, and the sick cat lived another four years. Oh, that's Wasn't how that many different amazing? blood types are there for cats? Yeah. Well, they have basically three. A, B, and A, B. B is very rare. So most random cats are A, and you cannot give that blood to a B-type cat because the A cat has anti-B antibodies in its blood. Oh, so wow. if you transfuse the common blood type to a B cat, with a rare B cat, and there's certain breeds that are more susceptible, you'll kill them because the anti-B antibodies will neutralize and damage and destroy the cat's own blood cells. And then A, B is basically neutral. It's, it's, then they're very rare. Okay. Amazing. New yeah. things. I learn new things every day. Every day we learn new things. <laughs> All right. Nutritional support. <laughs> okay. So here's our cat eating food. And you'll notice this cat's not white. Right. <laughs> so it's going to have less environmental issues than the white cat originally. And we've talked about this basically already today. Therapeutic diets are restricted in protein, phosphorus, and sodium, and they're high in water-soluble vitamins, fiber, and antioxidants. They can prolong life, but many cats hate them. They don't taste very good. <laughs> they're often unpalatable. They won't eat them. So what do people do in desperation? They feed anything. So you need to have alternative diets. Food texture is important food temperature mm -hmm. is important, mm -hmm. and food flavor is important to the cat. And you have to, it's essential they keep eating. So sometimes we have to compound foods that have special flavors in them for cats to get them to eat. So finally, um, we've talked a lot about diets and different things, but it's really important that they eat. So what's the prognosis? It varies all over the map. Some cats do incredibly well with all of the options we've talked about today. Others, no matter what you do, will not improve. So we really can't predict it until we try it. Cats losing more protein in their urine will have a less favorable outcome. And that's obvious because their kidneys just can't filter the protein and keep it in the blood, okay? The most important thing is early diagnosis and treatment for quality of life and survival. And what we want is quality of life, even if it's a shorter term period. 
Right. So please, if your cat is ADR, go to your veterinarian as soon as possible. That's amazing. And, and, and so great for you to give us all of these symptoms to be looking for. I never thought to think to look at the bottoms of their pads. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I didn't know and that. We've got one, one, more, one more slide. Um, yes. And this I, it's is up. from Hippocrates. Yeah. And Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Yes, and absolutely. That's awesome. That sums it up well. Yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and end there. Um, so, Dr. Dodds, thank you so much for educating our clients on kitties. I know sometimes with this podcast, it seems like we heavily wait on dogs, but I can't stress enough to you how much the cats mean to me. Um, I thank you so much, Jamie, for being here. Yeah. Um, how do people reach you if they have a cat with behavior issues? Mm. I encourage them to email me at getcathappy dot or sorry getcathappy at gmail dot com. You can visit my website at cathappyconsulting.com. Awesome. And Dr. Dodds, how do we get a hold of you? Okay, the regular website at Hemopet is info I N F O at Hemopet H E M O P E T dot org. Awesome. And thank you all for listening. Make sure you follow us on our podcast, both in YouTube and on our Facebook page. It's called The Spa. Um, we continue to bring this information to you, but we can't do it without people following us and helping us support it and share it and get this information out there so we can keep these kitties and dogs living happier, healthier lives. Thank you, everyone. Bye.